talks. And of course, this Monday night, we have Alice's Candy and Corn. Um, th this is the seventh, I'm, I, I'm reading the notes, but <laughs> this is the seventh thing. This is the 73rd year wow. of Alice's Candy and Corn, oh, wow. um, and it has a long history, of course, in Mackinac City. Alice came from Jackson, so I think she was the one that created the recipes. Maybe I shouldn't say anymore. And then Chuck, <laughs> Chuck and Ginny, I don't want to give away the story either. Chuck and Ginny came from Grand Rapids. Jesse comes from Sheboygan, and they're going to share their history, but before they do, a couple of announcements. Uh, one, I wanted to announce that one of our board members passed away, Greg Harwick, uh, passed away last week, I guess it was. Um, so that's sad news for all of us. He was a really great volunteer in Mackinac City. Uh, the other announcement, more upbeat, or maybe not, um, we're, we're starting a time capsule. We're going to bury it in 2025, and we want everybody in town to put down their thoughts for the time capsule so that when the people in the future open it up, we know what they'll know what we were thinking. So we have some quickie forms in the back for quick thoughts, and we have some intense questions if you really want to really think about what you want to change in Mackinac, basically. Uh, so I'll see if it works out. Anyway, they're on the back table back there if you want to pick one other of those up. Uh, you can do that on your way out. They require writing, so you have to take them home. Uh, other than that, I think Jesse's going to start off here. Oh, no, nope. actually, actually, I'm not nope. first, but... Oh, okay, I'm well, somebody's going to start <laughs> off here, and welcome, and thank you for coming tonight. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, somebody actually goes to water? Oh, oh, sorry. This is going to be really informal, and if any of you... Think of anecdotes that you remember from Alice. I would really like to hear them also. Much of what I'm going to tell you is hearsay. <laughs> because this things that Alice told us, because we weren't here, and neither were any of you. <laughs> so these are things that Alice, you know, passed on. And I remember, I don't remember a lot of names. I don't remember a lot of dates. Whether she even told me, I don't know. Anyway, Alice was born on St. Patrick's Day in 1899 in Jackson, Michigan. She had a brother and a sister, neither of whom I can remember their names. Um, during the 1920s, apparently they had a big hay fever issue in the family, and she and her mother and her sister, I know very little about dad. He just never was in the picture. I mean, he was around, but you know, she never talked about it. Anyway, they would come up here, and they camped where the bridge is now. Yeah. And that big campground down there. And she made many friends in that girl for the many summers that they came up here for hay fever. Um, she often was um, upset because Mackinac City did not have any kind of a candy store. And that bugged her. So, you know, it, it was just kind of in the back of her mind. Anyway, at some point in her life, she was taking the bus every day from Jackson up to Lansing. And she worked as a bookkeeper for Woolworths. And she was on the second floor of Woolworths, and her window looked out at a little candy store across the street, the Caramel Corn Shop. It was run by a couple of brothers, and that, you know, that kind of put a little bug in her ear, and she kind of thought that was really neat. And she finally approached them about teaching her how to make candy. And then she would work for them, you know, when she, when she was available. So anyway... Um, so this was all coming to fruition. Uh, her husband, she was married, don't know when. Apparently things were not going well because Gordon, her husband, told her that he was retiring from the fire department and she had to find some way to support herself because he was leaving her. Oh, okay. Okay. At that point in time, she decided that maybe the, a candy store in Mackinac City was the way to go. The Annis brothers, who owned that caramel corn shop, were fully behind her and stood behind her. Actually, all the recipes, Sandy, came from them, these guys back. And at that point in time, those were all the recipes from the caramel corn franchise, which started in 1930. 26. 26 in... Jasper, Wyoming. Yeah, <laughs> you can tell how interested I was in that part. <laughs> caramel corn shops were all next to theaters. And people would stop for their candy bars and their candy and their fudge 
and their popcorn and their caramel corn as they were going into the theater because before theaters did their own thing. Okay. Over the yeah, I, this isn't anything I talk about, but <laughs> over the course of the years, caramel corn shops changed from those little standalone stores to going into all kinds of malls. So there were very few standalone stores. So after Alice opened her store, she was one of a, like a handful in the United States. Anyway, um, back to Gordon, before he leaves. <laughs> um, he agreed to come up here. He built all of the cabinets that she put in the old caramel corn shop. And any of you who went there know that it was a straight line, and it was wooden, and I don't have, you know how you tell people things are built like, yeah, well, that's what they were. Those things were heavy and solid. They did not move. Anyway, he built all those things, and then he disappears from the picture. Um, one thing that we often wondered, because this is all happening before our time, he actually never divorced her, because when he died, she got his life insurance. Anyway, so he's up. Anyway, Alice, and I can't remember your grandfather's name, that Mr. Tyson owned the building that she went into. It was a little three-section store. There was a glass blower, and... What was the glass blower's name? Mull on that. Mull on that. Um, his house was in the parking lot where Daryl's restaurant is now. And it was a stone house. And your brother moved it up by your mom. Okay. Anyway, that's just, just an aside. Anyway, then uh, what was in the middle? A dentist, I think. And then Alice moved on the south side. And that little store was 13 feet wide. How far is 13 feet? Not very. And 48 feet long. The front third of the building was retail space. The second third of the building was storage and, you know, way and all the ingredients for making candies. And the back third was the kitchen. There was a little stove back there. She, her sister, and her mother all lived there during the summer for those first years. Now, I don't know about you, but I have problem thinking all there was was a toilet and a sink in that bathroom. <laughs> so we're talking, what do they call them? I call it a foo-foo shower. <laughs> <laughs> you call it whatever you want. Anyway, but those were different days, of course. But they, they are the three that started working in the shop. She had a caramel corn kettle with the window. She had a popcorn roaster. Everybody, anybody remember the popcorn roaster? She would, the peanut roaster. And then the dry popper for making popcorn. And then around backside, we had a, a small table for doing mail orders and anything else like that. And the refrigerator was there. And the chew table. Oh, that was the back room. The center room. Okay, whatever. Anyway, <laughs> um, she opened in May of 51. June. <laughs> we to do Whose part is this? Apparently, apparently, we didn't compare notes before we started. Anyway, but she was at the age of 52. Now, think back to 1951, and women did not do that. Women were not being on their own and actually owning businesses in 1951. So, that's quite, quite an accomplishment on her part, I think. Um, during the years... She had lots of, when we moved up here, I was in my early 30s. They were all elderly ladies. <laughs> Those ladies aren't so elderly as I think back on it. <laughs> um, lots from Mackinac. In fact, um, Abila Havich mentioned yesterday that her mom, Darlene Kruger, worked for Alice. She remembers going there in the morning and sleeping on the little couch that was back there and waited for the school bus to pick her up because her mom went in early in the morning to do cleanup, you know, like that. So she remembers that. Um, Emma Zercher, Sue, Sue Tamlin, and Sandy Kruger's mom worked for her for many years. I know there were various ladies from Sheboygan who worked for her that had Polish names, and unfortunately, I do not remember what all those names were. So, but it was all elderly ladies. So you can imagine what happened when we showed up. <laughs> she did have one younger gal that was working the year that we were coming to see Alice. It was Debbie Ryman. 
and she worked for us for a number. She was a senior in high school, I believe. She worked for us for a number of summers after that too. So we have we have had lots of really cool young kids work for us, and we've had lots of those kids over the years come back and tell us that they really appreciated working for us because we gave them a good work ethic. Yeah, but we were kind and we gave them direction as to how to do things without being nasty about it, because I know lots of kids have trouble with that in these days. Um, we always used, and still do, use copper kettles. Copper is very even heating, so it was always, that was the way it went. Alice started out with one kettle. She made caramel corn, she made fudge, she made pralines, she made shoes, all in that one kettle. So cleanliness was an issue with her. She just kept everything spotless. And those kettles, that was a big thing with us for many years is keeping those kettles nice and polished and shiny. And we had many people comment about that over the years. Hi, Bobby, sorry, I'm not bringing you up on purpose, but I already mentioned your mom. <laughs> um, at some point in time, she actually got to the point where she was busy enough that she actually built a little lean-to on the back of the building, and she put another burner and another copper kettle back there so that they could, they could actually cook two things at one time, which was a real step. Um, got the, because they built that, they also, do you remember Jim Alford was a school teacher here in Mackinac for many years. He worked for her evenings. Well, that would be summertime when he wasn't working. He would come in in the evening and make two or three fudges for her. Most people didn't even know he was there because he worked all the way in the back. He never went in the front. Not ever. And he worked for us for a number of years also. Um, and then they would also often work, Alice too, until 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning so that they could get the fudges and the other product cooked so that it would be ready for the next morning. Um, and then she was back there by 9.30 the next morning to open the store. Lady had a lot more endurance than I did. Labor Day, everybody here knows what Labor Day is like in Mackinac. Alice never opened the store till 2 o'clock in the afternoon. She was not dealing with all those tourists. <laughs> they, she, all her employees came in and they all had a lovely potluck at noon and then they just kind of sat around and waited for 2 o'clock. <laughs> One thing I know lots of you can relate, Alice couldn't keep up. She often had long lines out, outside her store. In fact, I think there's a picture around somewhere. I don't know where, we, where it is necessarily. But we have a picture of lines out the store, and people remember being out there and remember standing in line to wait their turn to get in. People who wanted a lot of product had better come in early and order it for the next day because that's the only way you were going to get it. She put limits on how many can boxes of caramel corn you could buy because she couldn't keep up. And she closed often during the day to stop to make product so that she could open again. And the line never moved. They stayed right there and waited until she opened again. Wow. I give a lot of people credit for that. But I give a lot of credit to her and her recipes for that. Um, let's see. <laughs> One thing that I remember is in March, she stayed with us for a whole year. Part of our contract was, and we argued with her, but she would not hear about it. She stayed with us for that whole first year with no pay so that she could teach us everything that we needed to know. After that first year, we started paying her, and I believe we paid her minimum wage because she wouldn't take anything more than that. Anyway, I mean, it, the stiff in her head was, you know, unbelievable. In March, we finally convinced her to take the day off. So the two of us are there because we've been talking about it. Alice kind of grew like Topsy. As she got more things, she just found a little hole and stuck things in that little hole. Well, drove us crazy. So that day she was off. We went in and we rearranged everything. <laughs> she had chocolates in about four different places. She had bags and boxes every which way. And we went in and we were, well, like caramel corn boxes. There were four sizes. So you'd have the big box and you should have the big bag that was underneath it and it would look like, no, 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 the big bag was over here. 
and the little box, well, that one was in the middle, and then it was over here. So even the caramel corn boxes made no sense. You had to really think about what you were grabbing when you grabbed. Anyway, so we straightened all that out. I don't think we changed anything on the counter itself, the display counter. But in the back, we moved all the chocolates and figured out a place to put them so that they were all in order. And here, OCD person, is that the right word? Um, they were all alphabetical. <laughs> well, that was that was ducky. We came back the next day, and we were so proud of ourselves. We thought that was so great. She came in. She says, "Well, she says it's fine now." She says, "But when you get busy, you're not going to be able to find anything." <laughs> she wasn't going to be able to find anything because we moved it all. Um, Ella stayed with us during our remodels. She didn't work seven days a week anymore. We got her down to four or five. But she worked for us yet the Saturday before she passed away. Oh my God. She passed away on Sunday. She had had a pacemaker installed a couple years before. And she was in reasonably good health. She was 85 going on 86. I think we did that. that did I get those dates yeah. right? Okay. <laughs> so she passed away at the end of January 1985. She was a special lady. I, every, many times I would ask her, somebody would come in and she would talk to those people and she was friendly with those people and they'd walk out and I'd say, who was that? She says, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you would never know that. I mean, many times because I'm thinking, Alice built her company on repeat customers. That's not necessarily the philosophy of a lot of the people in Mackinac City, but that was her basic philosophy and one we always followed. Repeat customers is what keeps you going when the weather's bad, when the economy turns down. It's repeat customers that keep coming back, keep ordering again, all those kinds of things. So that's Alice's beginnings. I'm done. <laughs> Very good. Well, it was an interesting uh, year to start out learning everything from Alice the way she did it. Some of them to us, why do you do it that way? That's the way I was taught. And that was the end of the question, so we had to find out. Uh, one of the things I will say, when you go into business with your wife, uh -oh. you never know what's going to happen. Uh, as I have found over the years, there's a lot of husband and wife teams. There is no way they could ever work together. Uh, I have an amazing wife. We've been together 53 years, so we made it. I mean, when you're with somebody 24-7, it, it, it can get a little <clears throat> dicey once in a while. You know? Everybody's human, but hey. Um, one of the things that kind of happened, oh, probably the second month we had the store, somebody came up to me and said, why was the enemy in your store? <laughs> what are you talking about? Well, Bob Heilman came in your store. Yeah, so he was introducing himself. Well, you can't have the enemy in your store. Wait a minute, stop. First of all, he's a business person in town. He's got four stores. I said, if I get in trouble because a supplier didn't deliver something, I more likely can go talk to him because he's come and introduced himself. Well, not only did Bob come and introduce himself, we'll go on through the whole time period. First of all, one of the best things he ever did for us was he introduced us and sponsored us in Retail Confectioners International. Very important part of what we were doing relates into Retail Confectioners International because they have four meetings a year, basically minor convention. One huge one back then was in the early 80s when we joined was always in Chicago with the National Candy. So we were able to pick up lots and lots of supplies. Um, met some fantastic people throughout the United States we became friends with. We traded ideas. Um, there was a group down in uh, Cleveland, Odell Malley. She started a uh, retail uh, decorating class or such. Well, Jen and I 
it was early enough. We weren't getting busy yet. We took that class. It was very interesting. We learned how to decorate windows. We learned how to make up uh, displays. And again, met more people. Uh, extremely worthwhile uh, organization as such. As we're moving along, we're finding out, and Jim didn't mention, but Carmel Corn was a corporation. They were in um, Rock Island, Illinois. Well, Alice, when we were negotiating with her in 78, was adamant that we take on the franchise. Well, we did. Well, as a couple of years went up, well, I got to go back to 79. One of the things that Carmel Corn was supplying and doing at that time, we found out later that they didn't do well with it, was the plastic bucket. Everybody has seen our plastic buckets, and they've changed in size. <clears throat> well, it ain't five quarts anymore. We've had three different <coughs> sizes, and they're all five quarts, no matter what you look at. Well, that plastic bucket, I decided to get a case. At that time, the case was 150 buckets. So I got it the week before Memorial Weekend. Alice is sitting there. You're not going to sell those. You're not going to sell those. Well, Dorothy Brown, who had been with her for a number of years, more or less looked over her Alice and such. You'll sell them. Well, I know only sold them on Memorial Weekend. I ran out of them. <laughs> she couldn't believe it. Well, it got to the point, by 82, the corporation was accusing us. We're just giving them away because... I was ordering six cases at a time just to keep up. 83 came around. They couldn't get me buckets. It's summertime coming up. It's March. You can't get me buckets? Oh, yeah, it'll be August before we can get you buckets. Well, there was a whole group of things that were happening. Jim and I looked at each other, sat down, contacted an attorney. And we got out of the corporation. There was a gentleman in Sheboygan, drew up Alice's logo. We got all the arrangements, all the legal paperwork done. And where's the other? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Go back. Go back. What? That logo of Alice. The, one with the first page. The oh, first page, page, yeah. That logo uh, took us like three months to make. It was off of that picture that we made the whole logo. Now, yeah, yeah, that whole thing was drawn up in Sheboygan. Uh, so we contacted, because of all of our contacts in RCI, plus the buckets, we read the bottom of it. And said, oh, yeah, okay. Regal container. So we contacted Regal. Yeah, you got to order 5,000. Okay, so we'll order 5,000. I don't know, maybe we'll have them for 10 years. But we'll do it. <laughs> yeah, well, they lasted a year. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so things started changing. We got boxes. We met a company down in uh, Grand Haven, made our boxes, and things started moving along. Finally, 83, we severed ties with them and, and got out because they could not supply us. Turns out they were in lawsuits. They were trying to sell, and Dairy Queen bought them up. And I don't even see, I haven't found the caramel corn shop in the United States because. Everyone we knew of or ones that we made friends with are all out of business. They closed up or changed their name. Uh, a sad state of affairs, but that's the way it is. Uh, going into 82, of course, before 83 there, we found that we couldn't survive in that 13 feet Jim's talking about, the 48 feet total, total distance, because we couldn't produce product. So we start, sat down with Ken Tyson and talked about knocking a hole in the wall and expanding into the two stores and moving the passage shop over into where the glass blower because they pulled out in 80 so we had taken that spot over already he agreed that it was a great idea we'd do a bunch of remodeling well the next thing was Wanda grew at the shop I thought oh my goodness gracious it's going to take me six months to get this project done walked in sat down with Wanda and Bill I says, Juan, I've got a proposition. I, I hope you'll agree with us. We've grow up, <clears throat> grown to the point where we can't move. We have got to get more space. And I'm willing to take all the <clears throat> whatever it takes to move you over into the first building at uh, 514 out of 516, because we were 518. I said, oh, 
We'll do it all, take care of it, won't cost you a penny. She looked at me, she says, you know, that's a great idea. I almost, <laughs> almost fell over, because that's just the way Wanda was. So we started doing it. Crazy thing was, when we were doing the move and she came in, she says, you know, Bill and I have been talking. We want to sell. Sugar Jets, here we go. <laughs> well, I knew Dick and Gene Hunt, Sheboygan, we've been snowmobiling with them. And I, one Sunday, we had lunch and I just laid everything out. And, well, past the shop became uh, Chuck and Dick's. How's that how that goes? So we expand the, st uh, the store, we found contractors, L&L, &L, out of uh, Sheboygan, and we made the big, big change. Put the mansard up on the whole building, changed all three windows out, changed the doors out to modernize and get going. Well, that's when we started really expanding. We put in two more burners, left, took the popcorn popper that was up front, put it in that back room, brought that kettle up, added another kettle over into where Bill and Wanda had their uh, <laughs> Blodgett ovens making the pasties. Well, about that time, there was a young man sitting in the back of the room there that decided to, uh, wanted to come to work for us. Not only did he come to work for us, he decided that he wanted to make a sign with Alice's picture on it. It was his first redwood sandblasted sign, right, Sam? Yeah. Yeah. Now, we, huh? Yeah, oh, it's not very good there. Um, He learned, and we learned. It was an excellent sign. Lasted on the building. Uh, no, the wood's gone. It's he made vinyl. <laughs> he changed it out to vinyl. Uh, so we we were rolling along really good. Things were going pretty good. We're moving, meeting more people. More things are happening. Uh, had great employees uh, going along. Uh, Nineteen eighty nine. Well, wait a minute. Yeah, we got a, there we 86. go. <laughs> yeah, get it right here, July 15th. Who are those people? Yeah. Yes. Our, our late firecracker came out of scene. Jim was due in late July, and 4th of July is always a crazy night for uh, for Alice's. It has been from day one. I mean, you're busier than a one-armed paper hanger. So we got home about 11.30. 5.30 in the morning, I get woke up. You gotta take me to the hospital. <laughs> yeah, okay, what's the matter? My water broke. Okay! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, take her to the hospital. You know, crazy things happen. She's been to the doctor Tuesday, nothing was wrong. Why is he? She calls me in the office. Look at this! Her stomach's going to her every morning. <laughs> well, Stinkweed there, she decides to do a 180. So they had to do a sincerian. Uh, the only problem was they had some little kid up in the operating room that blew his fingers off. So 2 30 in the afternoon, Katie finally came. <coughs> and there were the girls, of course, back at the store, hung in the window. It's a girl, and people come in. Well, Jen was here last night. <laughs> what is she doing in the hospital? Okay, and that was our, our major. Uh, change of our life because a lot of things changed. Well, one thing I haven't mentioned is we were fortunate in that my parents moved them up here first. It, so we had a built in babysitter, thank the good Lord for small favors, um, and such. So that was a big help there. 89 was another large year. Crandall's in the uh, Voyager gift shop decided they're going to retire, close down, and, and Jen and I looked at each other. Man, we got to get through their property to get to the back of this property to park everybody. There's no parking anywhere. What are we going to do? She kind of looks at me. I says, yeah, okay. So I went over and talked to Betty Crandall. She told me what she had to have. Came back. Now, what was interesting, Jen grew up some of her years in Allegan, Michigan, graduated from Allegan High School. Well, there was a gentleman she went to school with by the name of Ed Arbit. He was the president of First of America in Sheboygan. So we go down and talk with Ed. This is what we want to do. 
Yeah, that's no problem. <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> Baker saying that's no problem. That's scary, isn't it? <laughs> so, so we got everything all taken care of. Got it. The only problem was he got promoted, moved to Traverse City, and the guy that they put in place didn't know really know what he was doing. I heard the wrong surveyor. The surveyor ended up surveying the admiral's table. I told you you'd have a problem with a property lines your you're 10 feet into <clears throat> Wendell. I says, you know, that's really nice, but I didn't know I bought the Admiral's Table restaurant. I bought the Voyager gift shop. Well, you're the only one with a building behind it. No, all the <laughs> front businesses along here have buildings in the back. So we had to come back and, and resurf, survey everything. So that was a big move. Uh, we didn't get into the store. We had to remodel, um, get everything rechanged. It was kind of interesting because when I went over to get insurance uh, at Barnett's, the girls there said, ah, I'm glad you're taking over. You're taking care out of those extension cords. Out. I says, we've got it, the wiring. It's all new. <laughs> oh, they were all worried that the place was going to. Of course, if you ever been in there, that's all they had was extension cords. The place was so full of extension cords and lights hanging, it scared me. <laughs> Not only did we do the electrical, we had to do all the plumbing and everything else. Uh, oh, I'm trying to remember when we did the brown. Let's see. Yeah, that was just a paint job. Yeah, that was just a paint job. That was the first change. And then a few late years later, they came up with the turquoise and paint. I'm not real sure why we picked that. I don't either. I didn't know it was not one of our better decisions. <laughs> yeah, that, that, one, that didn't stay too long. Now, you can't really see it, but that's actually a little Katie standing there. <laughs> Got a picture on that one. Uh, a lot of good things. There were different things that happened in town. Um, oh, one thing I forgot back in 79, when Alice turned 80, I went up to City Hall and says, did we get a proclamation uh, declaring St. Patrick's Day, Alice Can, Alice's Jones Day. Ron Wallen was village president. His mother was the sec uh, secretary at the time, clerk. clerk. They looked at me and said, well, we've never done that. We're a government agency and never done a proclamation. We don't know how to do that. I'll be back. I went back. Of course, the internet wasn't here back then yet. A few years off. Well, I had seen a number of proclamations, and I knew somebody back in the city of Wyoming where I'd been on the fire department. So I made a call. Yeah, I'll get it up to you in a couple of days. So they sent me up a proclamation. So I tacked out the first proclamation the village did <laughs> for Alice, <laughs> proclaiming... Uh, St. Patty's Day, uh, Alice R. Jones Day. And Ron came down and made a formal presentation at the shop, so that worked out real good. Well, 89 after remodeling. Then the next interesting thing is when uh, South Huron got tore up. Greg remembers that. It was, there was a lot of fighting went on in the village. Uh, motel owners didn't want the street changed and they didn't want to change sites up. I remember going in talking to uh, Joe Duff and saying, Joe, this is how I got to move my sign. I want to do it right. Where can I put it so we don't don't have any arguments or trouble or that? And he looked at me and he says, no problem. He reached in his drawer, pulled out the paper. He signed the bottom of it. He says, here, I'll be down tomorrow and we'll decide where to go. So he came down and we decided where to put it. I said, Joe, this was, everybody tell me all the, he says, the problem was, Chuck, everybody else fought me. You just said, where can I put it? He says, I've never had that happen. He's like, you've got your permit. <laughs> I mean, there was no place to go. I mean, let's, let's do it right. There, there were some other quirks that happened to, on that project. Like, hey, Joe, where's the fire hydrants? He reached over and didn't, they had those uh, Merlins on the wall. He didn't lift the handset up. He just brought the whole phone over to him because 
That would have cost the city a lot of money if they'd have forgotten where the fire iron were going. <laughs> Crazy things. Um, moving aside, road construction went good. Well, another another first, 1996. Uh, I had another sales job, love sales. 96, Alice's Candy and Corn became the first and only candy store in the United States where you could walk in and you could buy a chocolate fire truck, a caramel corn fire truck, a tin fire truck, and a real fire truck because <laughs> I was selling fire trucks. <laughs> it was a great business up until 2016. Um, well, 2000. That's when we decided we had to do some real changes. That's the outside that we made and the inside was totally basically gutted. Uh, well, and all different windows and the whole nine yards uh, in there. So that was a major um, 2004. Jenna told me she was tired of making candy. She was tired of the store and we started looking. <clears throat> Unfortunately, it was also our worst mistake. But... That takes us up to 2014 when we came back. Oh, okay, that was, yeah, that was a poor choice of a person to purchase the store. Uh, and after oh. 10 years, it was, okay, we, we have to do something else. Well, yeah, no money, we can't can't handle it. And that's when a good thing happened, it's called Jesse e. Baldy. <laughs> uh, I had offered to buy the store for something else and contemplating it, and Jesse says, you know, I'm looking to make a change in my life, and I think I'd like to do this. So we sat down, and I'm turning it over to Jess. <laughs> I don't have near as long a history as Chuck and Jenny do, but that is how I started up here, but how I got to Mackinac, I'll give you a little clue on that. I came from Sheboygan, started working up here for Arnold Transit Company when I was 14 years old, pushing cars around in a parking lot, and uh, just... From that moment, I liked working up here. I liked working with tourists. I liked working with people. Got done with high school, continued up to Lake Superior State University, kept working at Arnoldine through the summer, studied uh, criminal justice. So after I graduated from college, I did a quick trip down to Florida, and I actually was a police officer for Brevard County Sheriff's Department, which I just didn't enjoy Florida like I did Michigan. Came back home, went back to Arnold Transit Company, Worked with them for quite a while, became the facility manager after Mike Frey retired, probably a lot of you guys know him. And then uh, then the company got bought, and it was bought and kind of ran like the guy that bought maybe theirs, and didn't last very long. I could see the writing on the wall, and that is why I was looking for another job. And then, uh, sorry, I've lost my voice the last couple days here, so. Uh, anyway, got with them, and just like they did in 2000, we had to start over. We completely emptied the building of all the equipment, uh, didn't strip the walls, but we had to clean them, changed every light bulb in the building. Everything was just gross. Took us about a month. We started at the start of May. We were hoping to open by the time we hit Memorial Weekend Friday, and we missed it by two days. We started on Sunday, Memorial Weekend 2014, and uh, we didn't have much. I had caramel corn, cheese corn, about four flavors of fudge. I don't even know if we had chocolate, we had some taffy. People wondered if we were closing for the year or getting open. <laughs> so we were going. And then each week after that, we added more and more. We finally got one cabinet full of chocolate, full chocolate, or the fudge case was full. And then we continued like that. And each year after that, we kept growing. And um, things were starting to get on track. By the time we got to 2018, that's when we started to talk again. Maybe it was time that they try to retire again. <laughs> we'll say try for now. Um, so the spring of 2018, we signed the papers and I took over the store. They didn't retire. <laughs> we kept them right on. Jenny was still cooking fudge probably, I'd say four days a week, but I bet it was five or six. Chuck was coming in and popping all the time, keeping me moving, keeping me going. They're still, I don't know how they learned it in a year. I don't know if they could. There was no way I could. There was what Jenny did in the office along with all the cooking. I don't know how she did it. I still have a trouble. So they stepped on with it. And, yeah, and uh, then uh, we got 29, everything was going pretty good. Then we get to 2020, and we all know what happened in 2020. 
We didn't even know if we could open the doors that year. So Chuck and Jim, I came to the rescue, come down, because I didn't have any staff that I brought back. They came, we cooked, we opened the doors, we put a table there, and we sold right from the table running out the cars, because that was one way to get curbside service, and we could keep, keep things moving. Then after that, it was just a hard time finding staff. So Chuck and Jen stayed on still for a, what? When did we finally say you didn't have to work no more? A year ago. A year ago. <laughs> so we went all the way to 2022 uh, with Chuck and Jenny. Then we're kind of good. At, we're back on track. 2023, we you know we had good staff last year. We were doing pretty good. And this year, I actually just found a couple more people. So I'm getting. I'm real happy about that. And this year marks 73 years that Alice has been in business. Um, things that we brought new. They of course expanded quite a bit of stuff. They expanded the chocolate line. I think you guys did crunch. She didn't do crunch. Tins she, and buckets. She, Alice did not do, she did not do cheese corn. So they brought in a lot. I have not yet brought in that much, but we've uh, added lots more to the popcorn with our specialty corns. We do a variety, maybe six or seven different flavors of corn, uh, cashew corn, peanut, toasted coconut, spicy cheese, things like that. We do our own cotton candy again and fresh squeezed lemonades. I'm sure a couple of you had them. You need to come try them. Um, other than that, let's see here. So just some pictures of the stuff we have done. This is the stuff they expanded. Just some things like that. And that's still what she currently looks like even after all the work. New, another new project I'm working on is trying to put up a storage facility in the back because just like them, I'm running out of storage ways, ways to store things with the way you have to order nowadays. But as that, that is Alice's candy and corn. And from then till now. <laughs> After that's just a little video, you don't have to watch it. But if you have any questions, you definitely can ask probably more that they can answer. Um, I, it's not a question. When our son was stationed in Iraq, we wanted to, we sent him the three corn, you know, regular caramel corn and the the thing was, it was for Christmas. We were not allowed to send a can with anything religious on it because it went to Iraq and oh. they would not let it come in, you know. So we just picked up fun ones, ice skate, whatever. Mm -hmm. But that was such a blessing that we could send him yeah, these are clear over home. there. So, And we still ship a lot of that. They built that. That's something Chuck and Jim did not mention. They built that mailing list huge. Yeah. When they used to do Christmas, it was probably just as big as maybe bigger than July. Not that way yet, but we're going that way. I'm going uphill. Since we started back in 2014, it's been getting better and better. We don't send out the pamphlets anymore, but we do everything online. Yeah. That's kind of what people do now, but still a lot of shipping and a lot of the military bases yeah. still get things. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was interesting. Alice did not solicit for Christmas time. In fact, you had a beg for a business card from her but she had quite a bit of business at Christmas time yeah. uh, we had to survive in fact one of the things I forgot to tell say was we came up to Labor Day Jen had said it that she didn't want to be on a, she said well you're you're not going to be open Labor Day until two o'clock I says Alice you want your last payment I'm going to be open on Labor Day. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the first time that year that we closed during the day because we even couldn't keep up it was something happened at her parents came up with her sister and husband Memorial Weekend. And they were standing next to me as I'm making corn in the window. And they said, you guys said that she used to have a line, but why is there, you can't keep up or what? I says, I'm doing the best I can. And yes, there was a line out the store. I says, well, look at you. There's not enough room for enough people to be in here. We're not a grocery store. Said, yeah, but I still can't believe people stand in line for this. I did get a good chuckle when you guys said, Alice uh, said you guys will never find anything in the way you change some things on her. I did that to them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the biggest things I remember is how Jenny was telling me we need to, the first year we needed to find the price of what we're going to sell each size of caramel corn for. Jenny would make the batch, find out how much it costs to make that batch, but then she would scoop out however many smalls came out of that batch. And we were just scooping and filling all these bags and she would get a count on how many that batch would make and my opinion was well why don't we just see how much pounds this weighs to get a per pound price <laughs> not that's not how we do it she said 
<laughs> made me laugh because the same things happened. <laughs> and that, I had an incident, I think it was 4th of July, they were lined out the door, and this guy cut in front of everybody. And I was making corn. I said, sir, you have to go to the back of the line. I'm in a hurry. I says, every one of the people standing here is in the same hurry you are. Please go to the back of the line. So he goes out the, the minute he got to the door, all I heard was <laughs> <laughs> crazy little things that, you know, that happen like that. And then Dorothy's husband, does anybody here remember Brownie? If he was that tall, I, I, I would say it was lucky. He did the next two labor, labor days at the door. And it was it was crazy because they'd look at him and he, yeah, just stay in line, you know, <laughs> just the way Brownie was. You had to walk in the field, walk in the store, and stand yes, along the wall. And when you got to the back, you came around the front, and as you got to the front, then you got to pick what you wanted and buy what you wanted and leave. But you had to stay in line. And when you stay in line, or I think he carried a stick, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> well, then, after the remodel in uh, 83, when we came back at that Christmas of 83, the postmaster came in and we had boxes lined up against the north wall, lined up against the street there. He walks in and he takes them. You're not bringing all those to us. No, they're going to UPS. <laughs> <laughs> he was mortified that we were going to dump that, that load on him. Oh, yes. That's something that I forgot to mention. She bought a little cottage down in Lakeside, had it remodeled so that it was winterized, and she moved in in 58. And then starting mm -hmm. in 59, then she was open year-round. She was only open summers before that because she had no place to stay. And she was also open 365 days a year. Wow. Oh, Alice had no close family. And some of the family that she did have, she kind of disowned. Mm. And I never knew why. That was just all that she ever said. So if she was at the store on Thanksgiving or Easter or on Christmas, if two or three people walked in the door, that was two or three people more than she would have seen had she stayed home. So, and that was one of the things where we were always, towards the end, we were cautious about giving her more than one day off at a time. Because we knew that on days when she didn't have to work, she did not even get dressed and she did not leave the house. And with an elderly lady, that's not a good thing. She had to have a purpose. So. Yeah, there, there was a lot of times that people said, well, why did you keep her around? I said, well, you know, you ever heard the word advertising? <laughs> she was a great advertiser. And one of the times, it was the first year we were there, and I was just made a batch of corn, dumped it in the window, and some guy came in, and he got some corn. <clears throat> of course, you know, we always went from the window into a can unless it was special. Nobody's around. It's real slow to get it out of the window, but and he took it out. And, oh, this don't say stay. This don't taste the same. She was standing in the center room. She heard him. She walked out. She says, "Well, I made that batch." <laughs> he didn't know what to say. <laughs> we had a because she was there, we had a number of years before people ever really realized that we had bought the store. Uh -huh. she figured, no, she think, people figured that we were just working. <laughs> How and now we're work? having the same thing with Jesse. I, <laughs> I actually kind of like said, it that well, way, is he still working for you? I said, no, he bought it like five years ago. <laughs> I, I think when we talked about it, too, to keep it that way, a little bit on purpose. Purpose because because of the change that happened when they left once before I didn't want people to think that was going to happen yeah. again so we thought they're there enough don't even it doesn't matter who owns it as long as they're there yeah. he kept uh, what, that. Did, what made you was there an ad for her selling how, how did you decide <laughs> oh, okay. to buy? we both had jobs okay we did not have careers we both had jobs and he had always wanted to move up here we wrote Alice a letter 
he had been coming through here since he was a kid because his dad was from Superior. And when you're waiting for the ferry, Alice's was really, Tommy yeah. Shop was really right in the way. And his mother had met her even longer before that because she'd been coming up here since like the 30s and 40s to vacation. Anyway, we wrote her a letter and asked her if she knew of any place in Mackinac that was the people were thinking about selling because we were interested in buying something. Well, she wrote back quite quickly. Oh, yeah. And yeah. said that she knew that the big boy was opening, but that had a... So that's when the big boy opened, too, 79, 78, 79. It was April 2nd of okay. 79. Anyway, so she said that. She says, but I'm thinking of selling at the end of the year if you would be interested. We looked at each other and said, hey, Friday night, we're driving to Mackinac. <laughs> she was okay, also, she didn't want anybody to know that she was selling. The banker that we dealt with was the only person here that knew what was going on. We could not even leave a message with his secretary. We had to just tell his secretary, have him call us. And then he would call us back. Well, tell him who her secretary was. Oh, well, no, I'm not going <laughs> to. Because everybody knows her and they know that she was a big mouth. So I'm not going to. She was a That's a And that was, I think, and that's, Alice was a very private person. Nobody needed to know her business. In fact, along that same line, all the years she was in business, she would make a deposit of her money into a, in, into a local bank and then immediately write a check and send the money downstairs. She didn't leave the money with her. All her bookkeeping was done in Lansing. Oh, my God. Yeah, I mean, it, it, because when we went to the bank, John Wanky was vice president of uh, Sheboygan Bank at the time, a local Sheboygan guy. Uh, we had quite a conversation in the number of dealings we had with him and he says you know, normally he says a normal bank wouldn't even accept what you want to do well i had just graduated well actually we were doing all this i was still in college he says the president of the bank art no no john's boss oh, was, um, he said you are the first person in Mackinac city to give a true business description on what you're going to do. He said, and I'm going to tell you right now, we all looked at it and said it's fantastic, but he's really conservative. Yeah. We had to get a, her dad had a cosign for us. Well, we had bought a house, buying a business. At Christmas time, of 79, I handed him his note back. Didn't need it. And we paid Alice off wow. in one year. <laughs> well, I tell you what, <laughs> there were a lot of long nights and days that uh, I would say the first <clears throat> five months we didn't take a day off, but it was worth every every hour we spent there. Uh, <clears throat> uh, can't say enough about Alice. She was fantastic. Yes. We had a question about uh, <coughs> if you could remind us where the original location was. Just what? next door to the building now. It was the, the uh, one building south that was 518 South Huron. And the building now is at 512. Cool. Thank so, you. So we did. Well, see, and that was when we were thinking about getting a bigger building. We said we can't do anything better than just move to the next building. People don't have to worry about finding us because yeah. they can still see the sign and still say we're here. And then you'd have people who come in and say, you remodel. Well, yeah, I think we moved. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even realize we moved. Like, well, yeah. Jesse just said that a week ago. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, there's been, okay, I deliver his mail in the in the morning usually. And he'll eat, you know, got an errand or something he may need that he can't get out because he's all by himself this winter. So a lot of times, and that's where a lot of people still think that we're, Jen and I are in and out of there a lot because she comes and helps him with the books and it's such. It's you know, if he needs help, he knows who to call. In fact, yeah, he had that. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I keep him. I keep him moving. <laughs> he had an employee get sick and he had all of the Easter stuff to get out. So <laughs> yeah, I, was, I just left first, but we just went to the Wisconsin Dells. My wife and our kids. We just left. 
And I called Jack and Jen, can you go down and do it? Now they hadn't done shipping in a little bit. Now it's online. <laughs> oh, yeah. so they, but we got through it. What did we do? Pull over on the expressway. We did. Yeah, so we got through it. Yeah. We got her done. And just so everybody knows, before you leave, we do have some caramel corn. Take a cup of it with you. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you very much. Because I really learned a lot. Of course, not being from here. You know. I didn't know you were that young when you guys bought it. Wow. Uh, that's, that's he was 32, he was, so he would have been 34. Yeah, but that's still young. Yeah, different regulations with USDA and all the other changes from the time Alice was doing it till now. Well, okay, How did you... USDA doesn't, well, in some respect, now. we're under uh, agriculture. We're not under... Uh, food. The food uh, yeah. people were food under the agricultural department, which is kind of screwy in a way, but that's just the way Michigan operates uh, on that aspect. Where the problems came in, okay, uh, for years we had a hard candy manufacturer in Chicago called Peerless. Well, about oh, 96, 97. Or no, it was after that. It was later than that. But whatever. Somebody came in, it was third generation, or fourth, third or fourth, whatever, and made them an offer for the the property. I mean, this is a huge manufacturing, the largest hard candy manufacturer in the United States. And the kids all decided, wow, that's a lot of money. And we don't have to work. They closed down. Well, we they had the hard candy recipe. I mean, if you wanted anything in hard candy, Peerless had it. <clears throat> that was one of the things. But it was very good quality candy. Oh, we excellent. still have not been found anybody to replace oh. it. Nobody. Nobody has come. Um, the cheese we use, uh, that's becoming more and more difficult to get because you can buy gold medal and sprinkle powder around and, and call it cheese corn. It's, it's not. We go, Jesse's still using, it's pure cheese. It's cheddar cheese. We have a formula we use, and that's why everybody loves our cheese over anybody else on that part. One of the biggest problems when we came back in 14 was, Aaron Sterry went out of business. They were a major supplier. Uh, a very important supplier to us because of the way they made their product and it's getting harder and harder uh, to get dairy products of really high quality uh, as such uh, there are some other things that uh, there was <clears throat> twice in the time that we've been <clears throat> with the store cna sugars went on strike one of them was at well both of them were at christmas time and we had stocked up the best we could for the room we had the one year, and it was awful difficult. And Jesse's had the same problem. We're on strike, they just closed down the factory for cleaning, but they don't tell anybody, so yeah. <laughs> when you're out, you're out. Um, the replacement works, it's not the same. <laughs> now, fortunately, our hot air popper, that guy's still in business. <laughs> Thank you, good Lord, for small favors again, because, oh, without that, and Jesse from a gentleman uh, that Alice trained went out west. Um, Bowers. Mr. Bowers. Ray Bowers. Or not Ray. Gary Bowers. Gary. He was able to pick up a second machine that got to be rebuilt, but mm -hmm. it'll still work for a backup. Mm -hmm. There are certain products that are just difficult to get. The nice thing about in the candy industry, if you get into the chocolate making and some of the specialties, the only thing that's changed since 1901 to 2024 is the electrical workings and maybe some of the gear work. But the principal idea has never changed because nobody has ever been able to come up with a better system for 99% of the candy machines that are out there. And I mean, I'm talking some that are bigger than this whole building. 
they're all the same. Then if you go into some that, well, Peerless still had all of their original equipment for the hard candy making uh, from the 1900s. So, uh, one of the chocolate machines, uh, when we were with the retail confectioners, the gentleman that designed uh, what they call the, uh, the little dipper <laughs> and the big dipper. Uh, I got to go around with him when we were at a, con a convention up in Philly. Everybody was out at Atlantic City. And he says, let's go walk the Bard Walk. Well, he was a very, very interesting man, knew his stuff right and left. And we'd walk, the first store we walked into, he says, you know, such and such, no, they're, they're off today. And he says, well, I'm Alan Hilliers. I just want to take a look at your uh, chocolate machine and make sure it's working right, the Hilliers machine there. Oh, okay. So yeah. he went in and he said, oh, yeah, okay. He did change it like I told him to. Yeah. Okay, yep, yeah, it's working right. So, all right, go into the next door. Oh, the guy goes, oh, Alan, how you doing? He says, hey, I got a problem with my sh Yeah, what do you want me to do? Didn't even let the guy finish what was wrong with it. He just went on. They were his babies. Uh, and to get to know the guy and understand why he was making the machines actually showed me a better way of using it. Just walking around with him to these different candy stores while everybody else was up gambling. <laughs> I had more fun with him and learned... But as far as I was concerned, I made more money with him than I could in, a, in the uh, up in the casino. So, I mean, these are some of the things that I mean. There's so many stories with the, the retail confectioners that are just phenomenal. Uh, the people I met and the things I learned just from being with them or listening to them. It was great. Is that correct? We had a question about where Alex is buried. In Jackson. Jackson. Okay. Perfect. In yeah. fact, um, yeah. yeah. What? Doug Vernon did the uh, internment. Did Reverend, so Reverend Vernon from Church of Straits did the internment down in Jackson uh, when she was buried. We had a service up here at Church of Straits. Uh, yes, sir. What kind of uh, advertising budget? You didn't mention anything at all about advertising. Well, you know, this, this young lady sitting next to me, I don't know if you've recognized her yet because she worked for me for a couple of summers. Well, she's going to tell me your name because I probably changed. Everybody in Jackson City heard I'm Chris. Okay. It's been a long time. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 The advertising budget. Well, that, that, that was going to finish that. The advertising, as far as I was concerned, when she came home from work, and all I had to do was that little neck snip. Yes. <laughs> I, said, I, need to, I need to go up and buy a bag of caramel corn unless you brought me some. Well, that, there's more, more truth than that. I was the one that lived at Chagoyne State Park. Oh, yes. Okay. All right. See, and, and, and as far as an advertising budget, we didn't have one, per I knew se. That. I knew that. I just wanted um, to. Yeah. If, if we felt right, we did it. We didn't do a whole lot of advertising. We didn't. It was word of mouth. Yeah. It was, you came up here, but you went home and you told somebody, okay, I got a story for you. When we first moved up here, my dad was driving a long-haul truck. He was up in Minneapolis. And he was talking to the gentleman who was on his way to get his truck unloaded. And the dad said, I'm, you know, anxious to get home because my wife and I are going up to Mackinac City to see, you know, our daughter. And he says, oh, if you're going to Mackinac City, go to the store that you have to go to. And the dad says, okay. He yeah. says, it's the caramel corn shop. Oh, that's says, fun. Yeah, my daughter owns that. Uh -huh. So, you know, that's word of mouth. You, uh -huh. that you can't put a price on that. Well, and you put it out in the air, too. Exactly. <laughs> and when the wind's right, it goes up. And, <laughs> and we really put it out in the air now compared to what we used to. Um, <laughs> a little bit. Well, it, it's interesting. A lot of people here know Gary Engel from the radio station. I got to know Gary real well, and I got to know Dell Reynolds. In fact, I'm a ham radio no, operator. Don't so. go there. <laughs> so I, I really, really got to know these guys. And Gary would always come in in the summertime. Oh, you got to advertise. I said, Gary, it's summertime. I don't need to advertise in the summer. Come back and see me in October. <laughs> well, finally, about the fifth year, he caught on. You know? <laughs> but, yeah, 
And I think you're the same way. I don't do much for not a little bit before Christmas and a little bit after just to say thank you after the after the season. I have one more question for Sam. You got one more sign in you? <laughs> well, that's what put me on the side. <laughs> Alice has faded on the uh, south side. Well, let me ask another question. Do you want to go on another vacation? <laughs> <laughs> well, we see you next door working. <laughs> Well, we want to thank you guys for coming. It's been a wonderful evening. Yes. You did a great job. Let's go on. Yeah. Thank you. And I suspect that they'll answer questions, and there is a big tin of caramel corn in the back. So help yourself and answer. <laughs> let them answer your questions. <laughs> Do you go in? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah.